So, capitalism and the trap of materialism. Human identity is no longer defined by what one does, but rather by what one owns. But even while Rome is burning, there is even time to shopping at Ikea. See, when I moved out the house earlier this week, tooting my tiny things in bags and boxes and 50 gallon garbage bags, my first inclination was, of course, what should I purchase for my new apartment? Well, you know, just the basics. A shower curtain, towels, a bed, a couch, and a lamp for over there, and oh yeah, a coffee table and a couple of end tables and a TV stand for the TV that I actually need to also purchase. I think about it, I'm going to want my apartment to be my style, my motif. So I need a certain decorative to first up my apartment to be my style. Do stainless steel frames really depict that style? Does this replica Matisse sketch particularly picture my edgy and unprofessional vibe? Exactly how edgy am I? What espresso machine actually defines me as a man? And does the fact that I'm asking these questions preclude me from being a coat, a man's man? You still need to buy some cups, bowls, dining room table too, and a rug for the entryway, and a bath mat, and I'm also going to need hell. But what else do I need? Said Joshua Fields Milborn, co-author of Minimalism, and actually one of the two co-stars of the Minimalism documentary you can find on Netflix. He said that after his mom's death and his marriage was torn apart. And the first inclination, as he said, when Rome was burning was what he needs to buy from his new apartment. And the 50 gallons of bags that he was collecting to move from that place were not enough proof to let him know that he doesn't need to buy anything more. Well, let me take you to why I'm talking about this to begin with. What would a girl like me, who most of you know and notice that she wears brand names and she likes fashion and style? Well, some of you who know me knows that I had a YouTube channel, I was talking about organization, and I ended up owning so many things until a hate comment came and told me, what the hell are you talking about? You have a lot of things you own, and you talk about organization. So I watched a TED talk. I saw in that TED talk a man saying he owns only 100 items. And from there, he challenged people at the end of the talk to count how many items they own. When I counted, I found that I owned 8,000 items. And at that time, I was 21 years old, still in university. That was the challenge. I went down from 8,000 to 340, with my two suitcases moving here to Germany in 2016. And that was the start of this topic, rippling an effect in my head. Came later on, when we took design theory in my university, and I think if you attended my Sunset presentation before, when I was talking about all the design theories that really, really made me wake up from this idea, and how this tackled me differently. If I take time to talk about all these, we're going to take the entire day, but let me take from you maybe one or two randomly. Maybe let's talk about the social penetration theory that treats societies or humans as onion peels where you need to penetrate layer by layer until the human psychology changes and accepts certain things. And your subconscious would turn you into someone different and make society more trendy, as they say. Or maybe we can talk about the cognitive dissonance theory of you thinking you're selecting what you're selecting, but in fact you're selecting from a selection of things someone else selected for you. Okay, that sounds complicated. Let's simplify it. You go on a plane ride, the woman comes to you, or the man, and he asks you, oh, beef or chicken? <coughs> you say chicken, they say sorry, we only have beef. And here it is, what did you select? You select someone else's choice, thinking that it is yours. When I started my project, these were my ideas in the beginning. And I had to start researching, and my research started with statistics. I like them, for me they sound like scientific facts somehow, especially when they look back in time. And 
And it struck me when I knew that the example goes for the US, that we have three times as much space as a person who used to live in the 1950s, which means the average US resident has much individual space in their house as an entire 1950s family. And of course, you buy the biggest house your budget can get. You don't buy the house that actually fits your needs, because that's how it is. Which makes you want to fill this space, because, you know, it sounds echoey, it's empty. So you spend time to fill that space which ends up being eight and a half years of shopping if you live to be 63. Lastly, you have to take care of the things you bought, even your house, which leads up you spending around 21.5 hours weekly to take care of household maintenance, doing laundry, cleaning. Let's have a quick count of all of this. So you work for 40, hours a week to get money and maintain your things for 5.04 hours, 21.5 hours shopping leads to 66.54 as you can see, which is 9.5 hours a day. At 8 hours of sleeping, 1.5 hours if you have to prepare to go out or come back home from work, all of this. And the 9.5 hours we've mentioned, and you've got 5 hours every day to enjoy your life, to have a hobby to meet people, to do what us humans really long for most. Okay, I'm not telling you like ditch all of this and live on the streets as well, but let's actually ask ourselves if what most of the people say, 1950s were the epitome of everything, it was like the balance between us before and us in the future right now. What happened? And since when did that start? So my research took me to materialism and politics humans and social entities were actually something triggered and tackled and that was the reason why this change happened. So you see, at least I'm going to talk from ancient Egyptian perspective because that's where I'm coming from. Back at the time, society believed that there are two main social clusters, the high class, the emperors, the kings, the gods, and the social class that actually serves that class. So there was no need to do anything like this aside from these people serving those people thinking that religiously they're doing the right thing. Until in the 17th century, after the trade became a big thing, Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, and how he started this was saying that everyone should have more wealth, should invest and should go into trade, and trade became a thing. Fast forward to kind of work on this more, the Industrial Revolution happened, which made mass production available. What did this lead to? It led to department stores existing. So instead of craftsmanship, which is not definitely a bad thing, till this point we were okay, but department stores replaced mankind. So the man, he had to do what? Just play a button on a machine, or work the machine, or call in the machine in order for this machine to produce 10,000 copies of the same thing. And then my favorite, in the 1920s, Edward Bernays, father of PR, he came inspired from Freud. And his idea was how can we tackle human behavior? How can we not make people think about things they want, but rather the life they want through these things? That was the start of the propaganda. Capitalizing on this, there were some people waking up Still, it wasn't that bad at the time, somehow. In the 60s, the hippie movement rebelled against capitalism and asked for social justice between people at the end, stopping to aim for having things to kind of reflect who we are. And then in the 70s, when we started to know how consumerism has an environmental aspect, which we are kind of ruining the environment by producing so many things, and organizations like Greenpeace came into life. Later on in the 80s, the American dream was so capitalized at the point. The American dream right now is kind of the template of big cities who come with dreams to earn more. Globalization came in. I remember the stories my grandmother used to tell me about the computer for every house campaign. 
Yes, it took place even in Egypt, like in everywhere. People owning a, a machine that would open the world to them. Until we've reached to now. Every year we throw about 1.5 million computers, 99% of them working. So it's not the fact that we need the computer, and it's not the fact that it stopped working anymore. We buy the newest thing. We want the newest thing. We buy it cheap, so when it goes bad, we throw it away instead of trying to find a way around it not being working. What took actually a century the US to develop took China way less than that, which kind of made things go faster than ever. I think this was more clear for me when I looked at materialism and fashion. If any of you know the Bangladesh incident of Rana Plaza in 2013, the garment factory that fell over the workers working in it, knowing that the building is going to fall, locking them inside so that they can deliver things to J. Crew. And guess what? Things went to J. Crew. That's actually what the case was in the court. People wore these things in the streets while people died on the same day doing them for them. Then materialism and happiness. Because, you know, psychology wise, why do we want to buy more things? Why do humans long for getting things? And I'm not exempting myself from that also. You want to get a promotion and get a better car and get a better paycheck and be able to buy more expensive things. That's a template, again, but that's not the template. Not the only template. The dream of being in a big city and a land of opportunity and seeing how cheap products became made us more disposable of society, more than wanting to understand why do we use these products to begin with. All of this shaped kind of my introduction, what I wanted. And my how-to question to begin with was how to create awareness by users through their next shopping journey and change their shopping behavior for a better quality life. The reason for that was I was able to declutter at one point in my life and get rid of things. So I developed the habit of getting rid of things that I don't need. But I couldn't develop the habit of making sure I control what comes into my life. And that was kind of the beginning, the push to this idea of me working on this. In the beginning as an experiment, I was kind of shy, very general in my ideas. I made a survey, 100 people responded to that survey. The questions were multiple choice. It was to the point, things like, how would you deal when someone dies with their things? That was like the extreme question there. And the problem is, most of the comments were very much the same, because there is always a template of the good answer. And I kind of felt distant at that point from people I'm interviewing or getting response from. So in my second experiment, I went to kind of a remote interview with some questions. That remote interview took place on Skype or on phone. And there were around 20 questions. And those 20 questions, I had three participants to answer. And the average time was around 15 minutes. What really controlled this interview wasn't only the 20 questions. I wanted to dig deeper at the point. I wanted to see what people answer openly. So in the beginning when I asked the question, they answer very the generic, the very understandable answer that you would say. Or what from the readings at that point I got. There is always the perfect answer, what we want. There is the reality. And what lies between is the habit. So you have something in the back of your mind. You think, ah, I do this. I always do this. List. I always buy things according to the list I write, but at the same time you run sometimes into sudden moving to this shop or that shop, when you see a sale, when you see this, you get distracted. What lies between all of this is reality and your habits and how they are tackled. For my next prototype, I did one-to-one -one interviews. They were again around the same 20 questions. But this time I wanted to get the entire look of the people with their answer on these questions. I didn't want them distant, I wanted to see them when I asked them friendly, like, do you write, do you really plan what you're going to buy in the day? Do you write it down? How's your style about that? In fact, at that point, I started to notice a pattern. So, when people purchase anything, there is three main stops they pass by. The first stop is planning. They think 
What do I need? I need this, I need that. And then there is always daily incidents, or what I will later call in my experiments my daily analysis. Lastly, they reflect. They reflect when they open the fridge to find something that actually went bad and they just bought it at a whim in the shopping mall when they didn't actually need it. So they reflect on this and say like, ah, next time I'm maybe buying this pack, I'm gonna buy the smaller one because it goes bad before I consume it. With these three steps, I conducted my first challenge. So you see, in order to get out of the trap, you kind of need to be trapped. Because social behavior or habits, there is no perfect answer to what is the habit of everyone when it comes to shopping. Because there is, yes, big clusters, but between those clusters fall people. And in order to change habit, you need to first monitor your own habit. You need to wake up and you need to realize. And in order to realize, I sort of thought I'll make people go to the kind of an extreme. So I had two participants selected randomly from the five I told you I'm going to continue with. And with those two participants, I went to a shopping van. So they had this challenge set to them, and on the same day they had to start for an entire week. They're not allowed to shop for anything. Not food, not gas for the car, nothing for an entire week. And they should do a daily analysis of what happened within this week and how they reflected on that. From the most interesting thing that came to me was how most of them feared a lot the idea of gas and food running out. It was only a week, but we also had that idea. What was more interesting is how they tackled this in the planning. So Roman, for example, was one of my participants, and what he did was he filled the tank in the beginning of the week of the car, and he wrote down all the destinations that he usually goes to, and he made sure to eliminate some of them that are unnecessary, that he can go walking to them or cycling, or find a way around it. At the same time, Serena, who always buys fresh bread, thought about this idea of either making certain types of bread for herself, or on the other side, buy bread that she can keep in the freezer and act around the bread in a different way. Came the next, I was a little bit more confident, had four participants, and again, made another challenge. This time the challenge was kind of requiring a little bit of work and the entire household to be applying this challenge with you, whether they wanted or not. And with that, I asked them to pick a category, grab everything in that category, store it, and whenever they need something from this category, they would go and grab it. And what really enticed me in this challenge was Astrid, who did this with all her cabinet items, like plates, forks, knives, everything in the kitchen. And by the end, they look in the box, what was left in it, to question, does it really make sense for me to own this if I don't use it on a weekly basis? Lastly, with my finished prototype, the same four participants, I applied for them a challenge. And at that time, the challenge, they didn't have time. It was right after the next challenge, right away. And in that time, my method was a little bit different. I knew that I wanted to make an app, and that made sense to me, so I made a wireframe. On a PDF I gave them, I was like, note down things. Some of them sketched what they missed or what they packed. Some of them put pictures. Some of them couldn't even use the template, did it outside and sent me the things outside and asking me to put them in. But the most common answer was most of them felt really, really trapped having both challenges right after one another. They didn't like that. At that time, my aims and objectives were super clear to me. I knew that I want to make sure that people recognize their own behavior when it comes to consuming things. I wanted them not only to monitor it, but be able to adjust it. And at that point, my research took a different place. I was looking more into the psychology of habits, how habits are forming, how are we understanding our own selves, how are we can adjust these things, and kind of the cognitive ideas we have, the subconscious. What do we have at our back of the mind when we buy something, or when we keep something? Do we keep it for sentimental value? Do we keep it because it was expensive? Do we keep it because it reminds us of a certain state and a time that we might never go back to? But once we see this thing, we feel that it's close by. 
leading to my design solution. My design solution was to create an app to challenge the consumer's behavior, to allow the users to identify their shopping behavior, resulting in less consumption. A fun way to challenge one's behavior with 12 weekly challenges, a total of three month duration, resulting in change of behavior. And these challenges run and shuffle randomly to the user, so the user should not expect it when they see their friends starting a challenge. It should always be unexpected and shuffle. And at that point, my how-to question became how to guide consumers to identify and adjust their shopping behavior in order to consume less. In order not to run out of time, I'm going to quickly show you some of the challenges. So the shopping ban I already talked about, pick from a box one, hunt duplicates when we look around the house, we find two waffle makers, one waffle maker, one waffle pan. You just decide which one makes sense to keep more if you're not the waffle man. Another one was digitalizing papers, CDs, DVDs that you never look in. So maybe when you have a digital library more organized, it makes sense to open them more. Money envelopes inspired from Dave Ramsey's envelope system to keep your money in. The idea of having cash instead of swiping the card, making you more conscious about what you buy. The reason why there are 12 challenges was after reading a lot, you realize that it's debatable between a habit for <coughs> 21 days between people, theorists, 21 days to form, and 91. So three months made sense. 12 challenges made sense because if you are able to monitor and adjust your behavior that long within the challenges, maybe that makes a ripple effect. At least changes one or two behaviors you have. And then, minimal came to life. Um, the reason why it became black and white in my head is that I wanted to be a break. A break from all the colorful things we see. It should not affect you in a, any psychological manner, have certain colors that work on your ideas. And it does not send you notifications either. It should be a selective choice to open, to begin a challenge, to have a timeline, to check your challenges, to make sure to have a daily log where you write down what you want to do and see your progress and being able to share it. And as you can see, you start a challenge, for example, packing, the packing challenge, you prepare for it, making the list, you go for the first day, you can switch between all days to see, and then you have a reflection period. I actually managed to develop that app. It's going to be available on Apple and Android App Store by this month. And I'm going to quickly show you. If you scan this QR code using your Google, it's going to direct you to this link, which is hsalama.com slash minimal dash app, where you go to the landing page of the app. You have a subscribe button on there so that you can get notified once the app launches the store. Over there as well, you can see my book and my documentation where you can read more about the challenges, what people did, see pictures, read my references, they were a long list, <laughs> and uh, see more everything I talked about today in depth. <coughs> Although usually questions are used, you know, to, to reflect on these kind of prototypes, um, or also to get into the topic, uh, to raise awareness about the topic, to build up the research question. But it looks like that you're using the questions all through your prototypes, and they seem to be a little bit over, um, you know, power and it over, it's over overwhelming the quantity of of, of, of reflection in a, in a manner which is really based on text and not so much on um, something which is maybe visual. Uh, the reason behind that was, through my prototypes in the beginning, when I had the interviews, I found out that most of the people, when you ask them one question, they just answer the perfect answer. Prior to that, when you ask them second time in a different way, third time in a different way, you start to get them to open up. So when it's kind of a brainstorming effect, when they open the app, they get asked at the three stages, sort of, but at each stage, that kind of opens up their mind a little bit to the idea. Did the best that you've applied really help you to, to answer the question? To answer my question. It really helped on people 
noticing the behavior. So the first part was successful. When it comes to adjusting the behavior, I think I need to apply that for the full, like to have one participant go through the full three months in order for me to see whether that will help them adjust the behavior for good or not. I couldn't test that due to not having three months to test it, but I'm hopeful when the app goes on, I'd see how people respond to this. And the last question for my part would be, could you explain those 91 days? So I read two uh, main readings about the habits pattern. One of them was saying in order to develop a habit fast, you have to take 21 days and you have to link this habit to an existing habit. So for example, if I wake up every day, brush my teeth, and I want to develop a habit of eating an apple, I should do this right after this so that it sticks with me. But some other theorists in another reading I read said that it takes a little bit longer. So you need to apply this habit daily, yes, for 21 days, but in order to become something you never think about again, it takes 91 days. I have several questions. I think I'm going to do one question first. It looks a little bit that the whole problem of capitalism and consumerism is kind of becoming an individual problem. Like, I have to conquer my bad habits to become better. Now, the question is, can the individual solve the problem of capitalism, or is there a larger political problem that we need to address? Because it's capitalism, as you said, an overwhelming system, and we're kind of the victims of it. Then we would have to also politically struggle to get out of that system and not just change our individual habits. I mean, what do you have to say about the individual issue of habits versus the larger issue of capitalism as a very powerful system? I would like to quote the Four Horsemen um, documentary saying that your dollar is always your vote. So if companies start to have one person less, it's the same effect on the bigger picture. When it comes, for example, to a movement like the Zero Waste Movement, they always tell you if one person can save a cup from the landfill every day, on the bigger picture, that's an amount of X in a lifetime. So as long as governments not being able to change, because I come from a country where I saw that change is very hard to come just from the government, especially in third world countries, I think we're aware of that. But when a person changes, somehow it becomes trendy. That's how also social media influence came into life. People wanted to see something relatable, less ad like. But even that community of influencers or humans that we can relate to is being kind of polluted with the same ideas. Companies send the people free things, even including me, I get them sometimes. But what I see is when one person changes and that one person becomes a model or a template that could be followed, if people follow around or even find something in between to follow around that maybe makes a movement. Like I've said in the 60s, it happened that the movement, the hippie movement tried to rebel against this capitalism. And I'm not saying that they could change an entire society because somehow it could be too late. But to say the least, I wanted to be able to give people who want to change something that would enable them to change. If you were willing, I think it clearly ends up, right? If so, so many people don't consume, it, it's fine. But ultimately, are you saying that this could change the entire capitalist system if enough people sign on to this? I think so. I think um, an example for this is seeing last week, for example, a place like Primark sell zero waste items funny, where they sell mostly plastic items, that means that the zero waste became trendy. So maybe when this becomes trendy and people follow it, people who are capitalists or capitalistic kind of companies would be driven to change. Okay, just one more thing, let's turn back to just a big point. Have you heard the word greenwashing? Yes. Okay, because the primary in my book, what you just said, it's more matter of greenwashing, so basically they maintain the power of their whole system, which is profit maximization, right? Mm -hmm. And they greenwash it a little bit. I mean, I, I, I have a lot of respect for people who all these individual mm -hmm. issues, but I think there's a larger political question involved mm -hmm. there, tied with recent wave of, of, of neoliberal policies of like making a profit of just whatever there is, including making a profit of all kinds of noble ideas like sustainability and so on and so forth. And I think there is kind of a it's a double double approach, the individual one, but also a political one because it's a huge political question.
little bit of a shortfall that you don't do enough of a political analysis and put all the emphasis on the individual, like if the individual changes, we'll be better off. Wouldn't you also want to do a little bit more political analysis? How we got here? As a designer, I think it's easier for me to tackle an individual than to tackle an entire entity. And maybe, as I said, I'm not saying definitely Primark, what they did is making them better, but at least that means that better became a way to get the money they want to get at the end of the day. So if that is what it takes for now, that means that's the start of the change. Maybe that would affect later on. So I'm tackling individuals. If tackling individuals become trendy, then this trend will be capitalized on. I hope it doesn't get soiled, of course, but at the same time, it's kind of pushing a change from a direction of sort. Uh, so and you do you intend to earn money with your app? In all cases, I think how App Store works is that at the end of the day, anyways, even if the app is for free or with money, you're going to get money if it gets viral anyways because of ads and things like that, unless you eliminate them, which means I have to pay kind of an extra fee to eliminate them. So at the point why the app is not live right now, maybe that's a question that would come, because to publish anything on App Store, you have to send it to Apple after you make a membership with the App Store, and they have to say yes or no. So I'm waiting for them to say yes or no first in order to unravel what happens next. I'm not planning to earn money, but exactly like the way my YouTube channel kind of grew. I wasn't planning and it happened. But if it happens, that definitely is not my intention for the app. Do you need, don't you need uh, to uh, somehow keep it up? I mean, to pay for hosting or collecting, keeping this, storing this data that you will be collecting from, I mean, at least this uh, emails and stuff? Yes, I am um, I'm collecting the data on a firewall account, which is something I also created. Would it require money from me? Yes. I already have individual projects aside from this project that I already paid for this anyways. So it's part of it. So is it just your pure altruism thing? Yes. This app? Yes. So uh, did, did you develop this idea and, and get this app to live uh, in like four months period or was this like a year you thought of this before and then you started to talk to people and do your prototypes and intervention and so on? Okay, so when it comes to developing this, I developed this in a month. <laughs> so it was very compact because in the beginning of any research phase or a thesis project, you don't know what is the outcome going to be. So you start researching in a topic and then the solution comes, or that was at least my case. But at the same time, um, developing the app happened by the prototypes. So they were very inspired of what people logged in. Um, the idea of seeing this pattern repeating, the planning phase, the daily analysis and the reflect came from this. Then creating a simple template for that didn't take long because it was inspired, as I said, from what people ergonomically did note down for me when they were doing the challenges. I was thinking about the 90 days that you mentioned. I guess this is a topic that has been in your mind for a long time, right? So, if you already try to change your behaviors in some way, and if, yeah, if you did, how many days? Like, you could actually tell if 90 days were okay, because you froze in some changes. It took me more than 90 days, but not to develop or to know my own behavior. Because in the beginning I thought, oh, I keep things, now I get rid of things but I get new things that I donate, which is again, contributing to the problem. I don't analyze much what I'm buying and all of these things, but at the end, I applied some of those challenges and you can find them on my YouTube channel, funny enough, seven years ago, six years ago, it's fun to watch me doing them, but the thing is, I did them and they worked for me at that period. Collecting them together and applying them to others, seeing how others, actually it affects them was the interesting part for me through the project. Yeah. As you said, it took me longer, of course. Is it a habit? Not yet. I'm eager to use the app as much as anyone <laughs> kind of prototype. But yeah. Um, I remember last semester we had a very great workshop with you on zero waste shopping. And I mentioned uh, you were saying something about tackling companies, uh, especially makeup companies. 
the ones that you can go there and give your makeup stuff and they can fill them up instead of you buying new ones. Do you think maybe conducting workshops again in that sense helps? Yeah. The thing is, um, I think it does because in my opinion, word of mouth works the best always. This is the method that was always out there to create a marketing aspect. When something becomes trendy, it becomes trendy by you telling someone, oh, I tried this thing, it was beautiful, and people trusting you that. The idea I had at the time with the zero waste uh, workshop was once companies know that it's their responsibility to sort the trash out, they're going to stop to make things that actually goes to trash. And that was like kind of the idea. So I would collect things that I buy, for example, from Douglas and return it to Douglas to throw away. Which is funny, the reaction of the shops when I used to do this, because they're like, eh, what? They're empty. I'm like, yes, I bought them from here, you get rid of them. It's not my job anymore. Which makes a ripple effect of sort. That's a personal thing I tried before. Making workshops is actually very nice. So maybe that's yeah, also a good thing. I think it's beyond the individual level, and this is what your advisor also mentioned. Like, maybe we can tackle this as a more structural approach rather of than course. affecting everyone. That's why kind of the idea of having a share button, although I was very hesitant about placing a share button in something that I don't want to follow what's out there with advertising, but I felt that when you share things with your friends, when something works for you, that maybe creates that effect you mentioned, in a subtle way at least. If in a magical world, a miracle happens and we'll get away how to magically dispose anything, we so we buy a thing and then you know, we just uh, disappear or like um, whatever. Uh, so in this case, uh, will, we, will we be indulged to buy as many things as we want? That was actually part of my research and I think it was part of our talk once. Um, sometimes trendy things do not tackle the behavior. So from the outside they look nice, they look trendy. So for example the idea in the minimalism documentary about tiny houses. Living in tiny houses instead of big spaces. But what if a person buys two or three tiny houses? Does that solve the problem of consumption? Of course not. But that's the reason why behavior is what you notice here, not the items you're getting rid of. Your behavior, what do you decide to keep and why, and dig deeper in that, because that always has a reflection. One of the people I've done the interviews with actually told me something very interesting. She said she was kind of really good at fixing the things, and she told me it's due to her grandfather. He used to always fix anything that gets broken, and he taught her how to do that. So that was mimicked with her lifestyle. And she said like some people would comment like, uh, oh, how do you do this? I can get rid of it and buy a new thing. And then she's like, I developed this relationship with my product. The idea here is two things. Why did she develop a relationship with the product to begin with? So that's a behavior that is repeated. The second idea is how does she actually go confidently to repair things like people in older generations used to do and not follow what is trendy right now? So there are two behaviors here that she would maybe notice and try to analyze whenever she repeats that action, then she can adjust that behavior, which will again affect the action she's doing at the end. So it's kind of a ripple effect or a schematic diagram of sort, individually per person that is going to... Thank you so much. I actually want to thank you both so much because I couldn't have made it with a full-time job on this topic without both of you, honestly. And I want to say that the shopping ban, I was so happy to do it because of you, Petra, doing the shopping ban and reflecting on it at the same time. And I am so thankful for the readings, the keywords, the things that I had to look into. It was very much directional with me and at the same time not pushing me to do something. So it was opening for me new keywords and new things that I had no clue about. So it was a fun experience for me to go through this research. Thank you. Thank you.